organizing. Um, how many of you are Joe's listeners? Wow. Great. And the rest of you, you said you got an email. You got an email. Okay. So this is Joe Yurith. I don't think he needs a lot of introduction for most of you. Um, he's been a a uh, very public figure in Portland for many years, um, um, much more than his program on KBU. He taught here, he had taught in the community college system, he was president of the student body here back in the 60s, uh, he's been an activist and um, an important asset for our city and we thank him for doing these two programs for us. Thank you. Um, Yes, yes. Um, probably the most important thing I did in education was to uh, working with uh, Roger Bassett in the state uh, education department and uh, Michael Reardon, who was then provost here, uh, and the president of Clackamas Community College to create a seamless, oh God, here's the language of education, seamless web that allow students to move in between institutions from the community colleges to the universities. I mention this because one of the uh, much ignored but quite important uh, emphases of the uh, uh, Obama administration is to try to strengthen the community college system looking toward retraining people for quote unquote the jobs of the future. Whether there are such I don't know but it makes sense. And uh, that was what we were, that really was what we were doing uh, almost 20 years now ago now. And it worked. Portland State is uh, an institution. I think most of the universities now uh, have this arrangement. It used to be that if you took um, a certain set of courses called a block transfer, you could get into the community, uh, to the university from the community college with a C average. That's still true, but now it's much more easy to use this institution to move from here to there and so on. Turns out there are something like 19 different ways in which students utilize higher ed in Oregon. And often it got cumbersome and often registrar's offices got in the way of people's progress. I think we cut through that, but who knows. It's, <laughs> it is after all a bureaucracy. What I'm going to try to do today uh, is to emphasize, you know, the subtitle of this is Why No Revolution? I'm going to try to emphasize some of the legal obstacles as well as the social obstacles that presented themselves to people who had a vision for an alternative to capitalism. I'm not going to uh, spend an enormous amount of time on talking about the various act activists and their activities, except to initially at least give you a, a, a brief outline of some of the accomplishments of the left in America in the period from uh, about 19, let's say, mid-40s to, to uh, mid-60s or into the 70s. And I, I do mean brief. And I also am going to want to make a dichotomy between <coughs> those activities which were either claimed by or rightly were the work in, in leadership of the Communist Party USA and those activities which were undertaken by a variety of other leftists for their um, for their own separate visions from the CPUSA. The reason why I'm doing that is because I feel at this point in my studies that the Communist Party was seriously compromised by its direct involvement. As it turns out, according to what I've read of Venona, the Venona papers, uh, that in fact uh, Stalin and the Comintern, the Communist International really did effectively compromise most left parties in most countries in the West, not to the advantage of the people, nor to the advantage of those parties. And that's a, a thing that people, particularly older people who've been leftists, really have not yet, I don't believe, come to terms with. Now, nothing I'm going to say about that justifies the behaviors that were exhibited by governments, particularly by the United States government, in the Cold War era. So we have to separate out the set of problems that are represented by uh, allegiance, which turned out to be, and I think largely unwittingly, to a foreign power and its interests, and interest in furthering a, a social democratic or socialist or more radical communist 
uh, direction in politics in the United States. And that, that gets very complicated and it turns it upon the twists and turns of our own, our own personal experiences and our own personal biases to a great extent. But what I'm going to try to do is just outline some historical stuff and go from there. The first piece of legislation that's relevant to us is the Smith Act, so-called because of Harold, uh, Howard Smith in Virginia, who was the author of it, also correctly known as the Alien Registration Act of 1940, passed in June, actually June 20th of that year. <coughs> now, remember 1940. In 1940, <coughs> uh, the Communist Party of the USA had taken the position of being a pacifist, advocating pacifism non-intervention in European wars. Uh, it had pulled away from support for the Civil War in Spain, which was a major United Front activity by the CP with the International Brigades and the Lincoln Brigade out of the United States. It was now actively using all manner of propaganda, including the uh, Almanac Singers, who later became the Weavers with Pete Seeger and others, uh, talking a heavy-duty propaganda game against war. It had essentially followed, in other words, Stalin's line. Once he made a temporary peace uh, with Hitler, and divided Poland, and the rest you possibly will probably know. Now notice how, how these things, these foreign things, intrude into the consciousness and the activity of the American left. And this is a, a troubling, for me personally at least, a troubling thing. So while we did have a very strong indigenous American labor movement, and while we did have very strong indigenous civil rights movement, and at various times very strong indigenous women's movements and so on, we also had this kind of big brother, I hate that word, but I don't know what else to call it, relationship that was uh, promulgated by the largest then uh, socialist organization in America, the CPUSA. So, Putting that into the background, we'll talk more about all of this. I don't mean to suggest, by saying that, that people who were members of the party, which I will from now on call the party, people who were members of the party uh, were insincere, nor do I think most of them were aware of this relationship, and I don't think they were wrong-headed necessarily, in fact, rarely wrong-headed in their political point of view. The problem that I see intellectually is that they were, many of them, willing to jump from one position to another as directed by the leadership of the Communist Party out of New York, who in turn, it turns out, were largely being directed by uh, the interests of the international communist movement, which in turn was largely being directed by the Soviet Union. Now, there are theoretical justifications for that, which I'm not going to go into, but they were there. So let's talk about the Smith Act. Uh, there had been previously Alien and Sedition Acts. The first and most outrageous was in 1798, which essentially attempted to make it illegal to criticize the government, the presidency in particular. <coughs> and it was imposed by the Federalists. Uh, remember that when the United States was originally created, there were many differences in the Constitution from today. But one of the things that I, that, uh, <laughs> that's funny, one of the things that Washington really wanted to make clear was that there would not be a party system. He really was extremely suspicious of parties. And he created, he created, along with others, a system that he thought, they thought, would limit that. That quickly proved not to be true. Two parties very early developed, uh, one uh, headed largely by Jefferson, the other by the so-called Federalists, which included Washington and, and Adams and others. Um, later, that system would break down and reappear, break down and reappear. Um, but basically, also, the Constitution limited who could be a citizen in participation in elections, as you probably all know. And we have seen a widening of that. Also, in order to make a United Nation, a United States, as you know, also no doubt know, we, uh, we white folk, uh, totally sold out uh, our Native American and African American brothers and sisters, uh, making them three-fifths of a person, thereby giving the South enormous and disproportionate power in the electoral, electoral process without giving the people who rep were represented thereby any kind of a vote or permission or freedom. So we begin, really, with a property-based system with, a, with a, a system that is class divisive. 
and very powerfully leaning toward the wealthier classes, the property holding classes of men, not women. So we all probably know that, but I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, there was the Foreign um, Agents Registration Act of 1938. Uh, that was largely passed in an attempt to deport, I mean really a whole law, in an attempt to deport Harry Bridges. Uh, any of you uh, ever been longshoremen? Uh, not too much of that here, okay. Harry Bridges was an Australian leader of the breakaway from the ILA, the International Longshoremen's Association, which was <coughs> largely organized crime dominated in the Gulf and the, West and the East Coast to create the ILGWU, I mean the ILWU, pardon me, which right now, by the by, is engaged in a very serious struggle for its survival on the West Coast uh, over issues of uh, coal, natural gas, uh, and grain import and export. And the hiring hall. And the hiring hall itself, right, thank you. So, you know, this is all, this is all very real stuff taking place right now. Inter interestingly enough, I just want to throw this out. I may have mentioned it last time, but I don't think I did. You should know that the reason why there's a police union in Portland, Oregon today, a union much criticized by people who are concerned about civil rights and liberties, the reason why that union exists is because the ILWU uh, helped them get created. Did I mention that last time? I don't think so. Very briefly, uh, they couldn't, under law in the state, and actually national law, uh, emergency workers can't go on strike. Uh, this was uh, sort of a precedent established with the, the rise of, uh, of uh, Calvin Coolidge uh, during the Boston uh, uh, police strike, which was a chaotic event in Boston's history in the 20s. Um, now, in view of that, it's very hard for police to make their desires to form a labor union known. The ILWU came to the police department and said, you know, under our contract, we, cannot, we do not cross a picket line, even if it's only information. So if you put a couple of cops out there with informational pickets, this was the old, in those days there wasn't a port of Portland the way there is today, there was a dock commission and then there was a port and they were separate. But if you put, if you put uh, pickets out there, we won't cross them and nothing will leave the, nothing will come in or leave the port of Portland. And that put enormous pressure on the city and they negotiated a contract giving the police a union. I just wanted to throw that out there. I don't think many people know that. And I think if they did know that, it might be a useful thing to to mention to officers, of course, when you're being handcuffed and maced or <laughs> tasered, it probably isn't too relevant at that moment. Uh, anyway, so, in 1940, there was a growing awareness of the dangers of fascism and of socialist or communist movements. And there was, at the same time, uh, a deep desire to create a way of controlling such activities. The Smith Act was the, ex uh, was the uh, expression of that. Um, again, really uh, under Title I of that, uh, all subversive activities, anyone with the intent, intent to uh, cause the overthrow or destruction of the government by printing or publishing or editing or issuing or circulating or selling or distributing um, or displaying any printed or other matter uh, advocating, uh, advising, urging, or whatever, teaching the overthrow of the United States government by force or violence uh, is uh, guilty of a crime, federal crime. Now, the exact definition of what constitutes force and violence here becomes very crucial. It's not really clear what the limits of that in this context are. Uh, that's Title I of the Act. And Title II of the Act allows deportation of anyone doing any of the above at any time. Now, in the, in the original effort in 1938 against Harry Bridges, the courts threw it out saying, well, he was possibly a communist a long time ago, but he's not now a communist, and under the current, that is, 38 law, you have no reason to be able to do that. But the Smith Act enlarged the possibilities, but Harry Bridges became far less relevant as events uh, progressed. And in the end, Bridges won most of his court, well, all of his court cases. And then Title III of the Act um, required registration of aliens, including fingerprinting, 
which began August 27, 1940. So if you were an alien coming to the United States for any period of time at that point, you got fingerprinted. Fingerprinting was then the technology to, uh, to uh, control. Uh, the, first, um, the first group actually prosecuted under the law was the Socialist Workers' Party out of Minneapolis in 1941. Um, and then the next major attack on people of the left was in 1949, after the end of World War II. Uh, the Foley Square Courthouse case of the 11 leaders of the Communist Party USA, which were given sentences typically of five years. Uh, a couple people were candid and got their sentences reduced, but essentially um, that was an effort to break the Communist Party, which really uh, was not that significant an organization, but remember an important fact. By this time, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and a number of people in the Justice Department had built their careers, along with members of the Congress, had built their careers on creating a stable of fear about the left in America and creating a sense of its alienness. The irony is, I think, that there was, in fact, this other thing going on in a parallel but unaffected way uh, involving the Communist Party with its uh, role in the Comintern, which is distressing but not so significant because in most ways the Communist Party was operating on its own, uh, doing what it believed to be the proper thing to do in a progressive sense. The next set of laws were the McCarran-Walters Acts, uh, passed uh, in 52. Uh, it did one good thing, it abolished race and immigration, uh, changing instead to a requirement of labor and skills for people uh, entering the United States but it also created the Subver Subversive Activities Control Board beginning on, on November 1st, 1950, which essentially required communist organizations to register with the Attorney General. It also required those who were communists to register and uh, to um, face deportation. They would have to defend themselves actively against that. It also uh, created an interesting clause, which maybe many people don't know, which allowed, in the case of national emergency, determined solely by the administration, by the executive branch, uh, when there was a national emergency, a national security emergency, all people who were on that attorney general's list, a list you didn't necessarily even know you were on, could be rounded up and placed in already existing concentration camps, which used to be Japanese internment camps. How many of you knew that? Okay, that that's, that's real. It's really real. And if you uh, are old enough and you have an FBI file and they give it to you and it's not so redacted that you can't tell what the hell's in it, all of which is very likely, you will find that you're, you will be one of a, a classification of individuals, very possibly one of those who would have been interned had that law not been made unconstitutional in more modern times. So this notion of emergency detention created an enormous increase in paranoia. Because what were the bounds of it? Who was on that list? How do you get off the list? There was no procedure. Let's be clear, there was no procedure. You couldn't go to a, a court of law in Portland, Oregon and say, hey, I'm on this list, I want to be taken off. There was no way to do that. You didn't even, in great likelihood, know that you were on the list. Remember, all of those files were not available until the late uh, 60s, early, well, actually the early 70s. So you had no way of knowing that you were on those lists it would be entirely possible that one day somebody would knock at your door and you'd be taken away and held incommunicado for an undetermined amount of time until the national emergency, whatever the hell that was, was over. And this is something that uh, is so, in our minds, probably everyone in this room's mind, so un-American that it seems almost unbelievable, and yet it's real. I've seen lists, I know about the lists quite intimately, they're real. Uh, the, the more important thing that was going on from 1945 on, however, is not so much the formal process, and we'll come back to it, as the informal process. And what I want to do to a great extent, I'll, I'll finish the law stuff, but what I want to do to a great extent is talk about the popular culture and the way in which the popular culture of the United States was largely manipulated against left-wing thought in general. And I'm going to use the movie industry 
uh, though I could use the music industry, but I will use the movie industry as an example of that. Um, but I also want to talk briefly about uh, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. I think I'll do that now and just get that out of the way. What was happening and why I mentioned the common term was that uh, Germany, Japan, the Soviet Union all were aware of the possibility of building a nuclear weapon. And the question was, who could build one first? How would one get the fissionable material necessary to build one? What kind of a device would it be that could bring the material together at such force as to create a nuclear explosion? If you hit it hard with an explosive, it'll make a nasty radioactive mess and a big bomb, boom, but it will not create a nuclear explosion. It has to all be, in some manner, squeezed together simultaneously with such force that those atoms simultaneously uh, uh, are changed into energy from matter. You know, E equals MC squared, right? So, and then, so the technology of that becomes particularly important. Being able to get, and this is relevant right now to looking at Iran, by the way. Getting fissionable material is one thing. Being able to build the trigger and the firing mechanism and the technology of that, which is less than split-second skills involved, very highly technical process. And there unfortunately was a guy out of, by the way, out of uh, Pakistan, a guy named Khan, who has, has <laughs> designed and successfully used his, his designs to make nuclear bombs for Pakistan. And he was selling and giving the technology to various nations. So there's reason to believe that almost any uh, group of with enough money and enough interest could be making a nuclear device if they can get a hold of the materials. And that control of those materials becomes crucial to those powers that have nuclear weapons to keep them out of the hands of those powers that do not have nuclear weapons. The morality of that, I'm not going to get into here. Uh, but... One of the things that we did not know until the publication of the Venona papers was the role of Julius uh, Rosenberg in the distribution of information about nuclear devices. It did not, in the end, probably move the Soviets forward in the development of the nuclear bomb by a great deal. Possibly, it was thought they could do it in five years, they did it in four. Possibly that is significant. Possibly it is not. Certainly it was... Uh, uh, and the, the people involved in that, uh, Harry Gold, uh, Klaus Fuchs, uh, Morton Sovell, uh, David Greenglass, who was uh, Ethel, uh, Ethel Rosenberg's uh, brother, uh, all of those people were lesser parts of a conspiracy, a real conspiracy, to provide the Soviet Union with information about the bomb. And, and this is something that a lot of older lefties really have trouble with because it became an act of measurable faith within left-wing communities traditionally throughout the 40s, well, throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on, that the Rosenbergs were afraid. Now, in a way they were. <laughs> the judge and the prosecution met ex parte, that means outside a court, to discuss how the court proceedings should go, how the jury would be selected, and what would happen if they, if they were, which was the assumption, found guilty. And it was decided long before they were convicted by the judge that they would receive the death penalty. So, whatever else was going on about their guilt or innocence, their trial was a mockery of a real trial. So, two things at the same time. Bad justice and guilty. And that's the worst possible scenario you can imagine, right? So, <clears throat> I wanted to just get that out of the way. Uh, judge was Irving Kaufman. Uh, Roy Cohen, now this is, you know, Roy Cohen was the major guy manipulating the case for the government. Roy Cohen becomes a major player in the anti-communist movement. He shows up again working for McCarthy. He gets his boyfriend, ah, the uh, gay element of this is always also amusing. Probably not to many people who care about such things, but I find it amusing. Um, his boyfriend, uh, G. David Schein, was drafted in the Army, and Roy Cohen wanted him not to have to do anything in the Army but to work with him. And the Army said, well, no, you know, he's just a regular Army guy, and he'll do what the regular Army wants. And uh, Roy Cohen whispered in McCarthy's ear, and McCarthy said, ah, the Army is trying to support communism. It's really true. 
they held these, he made the series of accusations, and the result was a largely publicized and actually real-time uh, televised set of hearings which destroyed McCarthy's limited credibility. And it was a very important moment in allowing the public information directly about what was going on with the anti-communist crusade. So I, wanted, I did not want to not touch upon these events. Um, now, there are two organizations. The Senate Internal Security Subcommittee, that's the one that McCarthy sat on and that Robert Kennedy was counsel for, and the House Un-American Activities Committee, or the House Committee on Un-American Activities more properly. And both of them engaged in what were called witch hunts, and that's a valid use of the word. Uh, in the 1940, late 40s, middle 40s, on into the 50s, the House Un-American Activities Committee largely attacked left-wing influence within the movie industry. And uh, was fairly effective at doing that and caused a lot of distress for a lot of people in their lives. This was not, <coughs> this was not simply to catch commies. It was about changing public opinion because the movies were, at that point, the major source of propaganda whatever kind of propaganda you want to think about. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, oh, I wanted to mention someone because he's, he's relevant, his son, I guess, is here. Hamilton Fish, the third, was a very heavy-duty uh, anti-communist guy. Uh, do not tar the son with his, <laughs> with his father's label, but interesting, nevertheless. Or is he his grandson? Pardon me? Or is he his grandson? Was it? You know, I think it is his grandson at this point. I'm so old I forget how many generations have passed. Um, you, you have this whole system, beginning with Martin Dyes and others from 36 to 44, which operated essentially in two frames of reference. Number one, to go after communists in general, but to tar the integration movement, the, the anti-segregation movement, with the communist label. And that was very, very important, a way to discredit uh, efforts to gain uh, civil liberties and civil rights for African Americans in particular. Um, but I want to turn a little bit uh, to uh, Hollywood, something I know something about. Um, there was a guy here teaching. I don't know if any of you ever had the chance to take a class with a guy named Andre Steinem. Anyone know his name? You should. He, uh, he's gone, but he uh, was at one point working in Hollywood as a producer's assistant and in various, uh, uh, various executive positions and on-set positions in the industry. And for example, he had a, a major role in producing the film uh, Stormy Weather, which was the first all-black, quality all-black for white audiences film. Um, and he did teach uh, uh, film history classes here that were really good. But he left Hollywood. Uh, he cut a deal with the House of American Activities Committee in which he admitted his own, he was born in Holland, he admitted his own uh, communist affiliations of his youth, but uh, the deal he made allowed him apparently not to tell on anybody else, which was an unusual arrangement. Because the way in which the committee operated was on two levels. First of all, there was public humiliation. You'd be called before the committee, and the same with the uh, Senate committee. You'd be called before the committee and they'd say to you, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And you'd say, well, you know, no, no, no. And then you'd say, well, I, you know, I don't. The initial response by both the Communist Party and by the group known as the Hollywood Ten was to stand on the First Amendment and to say, look, under the First Amendment, I can I can have any political views I want. Any law you any law you want to make is trumped by the Constitution. And the Hollywood Ten believed, based on who was on the Supreme Court at the time, that that was both a tactically smart and a uh, politically correct position. Unfortunately, the composition of the Supreme Court changed by one vote, and the Supreme Court did not uphold their right to hold that First Amendment position. So suddenly a group of people, many of whom were quite well off and very successful in the industry, found themselves facing serious jail time. And that created some interesting problems for some of them. Uh, uh, the, 
the main thrust of all of this was, uh, by this time, totally anti-Bolshevik, that is, anti-CP. Um, and the notion of disloyalty became a, a watchword in America as the so-called Iron Curtain descended on Europe. It is certainly the case that the Soviet Union won World War II. This is something we do not talk about much in this country, but if you look at the geopolitics of things, they won World War II, and the philosophy uh, initially of Marxism came to dominate the politics of the revolutionary groups that gained control of China and North Korea. So there was, together with the fact of the bomb, a reasonable paranoia, as opposed to an unreasonable paranoia, about the existence of this advancing movement of anti-capitalist sentiment. Now, at the same time that that is true, there was a lot of craziness going on. There was the notion that we had somehow lost China. Like it was just right here on the table. You ever lose your glasses? You, they're right on the table and they're lost. What? Where? Right? We lost China. Well, no. Uh, we bet on the wrong horse, Chiang Kai-shek, because, because a large part of our, our uh, Senate were particularly... Um, Senator Nolan in California, but a large part of them were part of what was called, later called the China Lobby, people who favored the government of Chiang Kai-shek, who laid claim to Sun Yat-sen's Nationalist Party. But his tactic in fighting the Japanese and in fighting the Communists was to maybe run away. When he had the advantage, he attacked, but it was rarely the case that he did. And mostly he ran away, and eventually he ran away to, to Formosa, to Taiwan. And so we lost China. It just got away somehow, and that upset a lot of people. <clears throat> now, I want to I jump to Hollywood, and I want to talk about this because, again, I think that one of the most important things that did happen in terms of public perception was the change in the view of progressive ideas, and it's really relevant right now to this election at this time, because from my perspective, we are on a vastly... Um, how shall I put it, a big effort to do away with all of the social reforms <laughs> that accommodated capitalism to democracy, to the social well-being of American citizens, and made things work pretty well for a long, long period of time. These accommodations were social democratic accommodations. Remember the distinction that social democratic parties allow the existence of capitalism, allow there essentially to be, in the Marxist terms, a ruling class, but insist that certain amounts of monies, largely from the upper classes, go toward guaranteeing people at every level and every walk of life, education, housing, uh, health care, and retirement. I may have left stuff out, but that's, you get the idea. That accommodation makes capitalism work. Uh, without that accommodation, you begin to see more and more money aggregated at the top and less and less money in the hands of ordinary people which, if you understand the concept of supply and demand economics, eventually means that the economy stalls. Ha, duh. <laughs> and, hey, the economy seems to be stalling. And, gee, the money seems to be gathered at the top. Now, you can draw your own conclusions about that, but those are facts. Those are facts. At any rate, uh, in order to undo the damage of the Roosevelt accommodations to uh, the problems of working people and the gains of labor unions, which were also part of the Roosevelt program because they raised the incomes of uh, industrial workers in America significantly uh, and made it possible for those people to be consumers. Remember, Henry Ford, a real Nazi kind of guy, figured out very early on that if he paid his workers well, they could buy Fords. So he gave them a discount on the, on the car, and he gave them a living wage. And it worked real good for Ford. But others did not see it that way. So, let's talk about Hollywood. During the war, Roosevelt encouraged the industry to produce films, propagandistic films, to make Americans like the Soviet Union. There were films like uh, Song of Russia, uh, and uh, North Star and Mission to Moscow. Any of you ever seen any of those movies? Mission to Moscow. You have. You seen Mission to Moscow? Well, they're lovely films. You know. Well, anyway, they were essentially 
deliberately and consciously Hollywood production supporting the United Front against fascism, which was a part of World War II. Uh, Soviet Union was our ally. There was at the same time, by the way, within the Communist Party movement in the United States, which had subsumed, uh, subsumed itself into the Roosevelt administration, not taking positions in the, in the administration itself, but supporting it, an effort to create Russian War Relief, which was an organization that tried to raise money to encourage the United States to open the second front in Europe sooner than needed. <coughs> What, as you know, happened is we went around the long way. We gained Africa. We fought a horrible and endless war in Italy, which was actually still going on at the point of uh, D-Day and, and even at the point when the, uh, when the Soviets were moving into Germany. Um, but that was the, the limit of the Soviet influence involvement, different than the United Front against fascism in the United States during that time. So everybody sort of follow that. So there's no disloyalty there, okay? No badness in any sense. In Hollywood, these movies were produced. But at the same time, a lot of people in Hollywood were leftists. Intellectually grew out of a liberal or left tradition. <coughs> some of the members of the Communist Party, actually many members of the Communist Party, producing some very excellent movies. I'll name a few of them. Uh, the one that uh, grabs my mind immediately is a film by Ilya Kazan, who later uh, recanted his left-wing philosophy in order to get to work for it. And to prove that, he did, uh, he did two films which were anti-communist in essence, Viva Zapata and On the Waterfront, Marlon Brando's famous film. Um, okay, but the film I'm talking about is Gentleman's Agreement, 1947, uh, Gregory Peck. How many of you have ever seen that? You really, if you've not seen it, you should read it. Uh, Jim Harborough was forced out of Hollywood, and he wrote the, the lyrics to somewhere in the Yeah, I'm coming to that. I'm coming. Give me, give me a chance. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, then another film in 1949 dealing with race relations called Home of the Brave. How many of you have seen that? It's a story of a black man who uh, is a soldier fighting in the South Pacific and is rejected <coughs> in his fraternity in college, is rejected in the armed forces, ends up having a psychotic break, uh, exhibits uh, uh, psychoneurotic paralysis, and is, is made to recover from that by the psychiatrist calling him the N-word. Don't go there too seriously in your mind, but that's, that's what the movie tells. Okay? Um, and uh, another film uh, that was produced during that period of time was called The Search, which was a film about DPs, displaced persons, Hundreds of thousands of people after World War II who had survived concentration camps or internment camps of various sorts wandered in Europe, particularly children, separated from their parents with no access to health care, no access to food or shelter. And this film was Montgomery Cliff's, I think, first the star turn, the by the way. Pardon me? The Search. The Search. Yeah. Um, really good, by the way, a really, really good movie. I saw it, uh, actually I saw it at its a premiere in uh, L.A., I was an L.A. kid, um, and, and I was, you know, I was a little kid, but I was very, very moved by that movie. Um, so you have films like Home of the Brave, Gentleman's Agreement, uh, a whole bunch of other films that essentially are telling a liberal to left perspective on equality, social justice. By the way, a gentleman's agreement is about anti-Semitism. I didn't make that clear. That's very important to understand because it's a post-war film in which we see American anti-Semitism being betrayed in the middle classes and in the armed forces and so on. Also about the kids, the Kinder Transport at the Repertory Theater, I don't know whether there's a film about it, but that it was a large transport of all the children from Europe and some of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... That was just in upstairs, downstairs this last weekend. Yeah, right. And also a huge number of children were shipped to Israel uh, out of that whole mess. Um, anyway. That's later, though. Um, during the war? Pardon me? During the war? After Kinder the war. transport is like... No, no. No, after the war, there yeah, were a lot of un, unfamily right, Jewish right. children who yeah. were sent to, to then Palestine. Right. Uh, <coughs> anyway... 
Uh, here's the background in Hollywood. Warner Brothers in particular, but all the studios in general, were getting really fed up with the labor unions, particularly the creative labor unions. Screen Actors Guild, uh, the uh, Screen Writers Guild, uh, and a series of others. At the same time, the House of American Activities Committee was anxious for its own political reasons to get rid of these left-wing, as they perceived them, uh, liberal films. So there was a real coincidence of interest. And the industry executives, the studio heads, cooperated extensively in betraying their own people to the, to the committee. Initially, people uh, like uh, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall and others went to Hollywood to say, hey, you guys, we're cool. Don't do this to us. But as this thing was ramped up and as it became obvious that nobody was kidding, a lot of the Hollywood liberal community pulled away from it because they wanted to keep working. And you, you were in, in jeopardy. And I'm going to talk in a minute about the whole system, which also worked in other industries, not just the film industry, to cut people out of jobs, including, very importantly, the CIO, organized labor in breaking the back of liberal left, largely social democratic reform movements, many of which had significant membership of Congress. When I say significant, that might mean 10%. Okay? So, there was the Hollywood 10. The, 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 the Communist 11 were, were sent to jail, right? First Amendment doesn't work. Hollywood 10 sent to jail. These were people who, hey, I knew Herb Bieberman. Uh, he lived uh, across the street from my uncle in the Hollywood Hills. He had a very nice house. His wife, Gail Sundergaard, was an Academy Award winner. He was a very successful writer in Hollywood. These were not peripheral people to the industry. This was the industry and the uh, government, particularly the House and American Activities Committee and, and its allies, sending a message clearly to left communities of influence that they would be broken if they persisted in what they were doing. There's no mistake in the intent involved here. And there's no mistake in the violation of the First Amendment that was involved in this. Now, I, I emphasize this, and I'll come back to it in a variety of ways, because in order to understand what happens to the left in America, you must understand the role of the repression of the left in America. It is, they are, they are together. They go together like love and marriage. <laughs> okay, that's a bad joke. But anyway, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about these, about these people uh, for a little bit. The Hollywood Ten. Um, Edward Dimitri. In order to work, he ended up being a stoolie. First he went to jail, and he looked around in a federal prison and said, Oh, this is really shit. I don't want to do this. So he, he rolled over. Herb Bieberman held his own, went to jail, kept his mouth shut, did his time. When he got out, he made a very, very good film, which you also should see, called Salt of the Earth. One of the listed, in most people's list of the 100 greatest films ever made internationally, it's one of them. So is that about Anaconda Copper Company? It's about, uh, about mining uh, with yeah. Hispanics, where the women end up making uh, it possible for the miners to win the strike. It's based on a true story. Um, uh, uh, Lester Cole, who did Born Free! <laughs> He went, to, he went to jail. I think he held up. Ring Lardner, he rolled. Uh, John Howard Lawson, he held up. Albert Mall. See, I break people into two categories. Okay? And I'm not very kind about this. There's the chicken shit people and the stand-up people. My position about going to jail, no matter what your crime, no matter what your crime, is you be stand-up. You keep your mouth shut. You try to the best defense you can get. You do your time, and you get out, and you can resume your life. Now, I talk a big game. I don't know what I would do. You know, look at that, look at that guy saying, you're a kind of a cute old guy. You know, but still. But still. Uh, I think it's an important principle, by the way. I really, I really believe it's as American a principle as can be. You know, or no crime at all. Or, yeah, I mean, you could be totally innocent. That's, you know, that's not the point. The point is, here you are, the door's... How many of you have been, been in jail at all? You know that sound? <laughs> when those doors shut? That's the beginning of the true test, right? No matter how they roughed you up beforehand, whatever, 
when that door shuts, you can't leave. You really, 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 honest to goodness, can't leave. There's only one way out. <laughs> okay. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Lawson held up. Uh, Albert Maltz um, uh, actually broke down. Samuel Ornitz, who wrote Bride of the Sabbath and a number of novels, Jewish novels uh, about American Jews, uh, he, um, he did not hold up very well. Uh, other people who did not go to jail, like Howard Fast, who wrote a series of very patriotic but left perspective books on American history. How many of you have read any Howard Fast novels? He's, he's worth reading. He really is quite good. Uh, Howard Fast eventually renounced his, his uh, CP uh, loyalty, but that's another question. Getting to change your mind politically is okay. If you do it under these kind of circumstances, not so okay. Do you see the difference? Do people understand the difference? Uh, you know, free will changes of mind are okay, <laughs> but doing it to save your ass, not okay. Well, isn't part of the point changing your mind has to do with being a snitch? Well, in this case, um, yeah. In this oh, case. yeah, let me, let me be clear. There was, I haven't come to that yet, but there was a whole system set up, uh, a blacklist system, where anyone who wanted to work in the industry, the movie industry or the theater industry, had to report to an organization, there were two actually, but one that was a major one called Red Channels, they would vet you, and you were required to tell them everyone you knew or thought you knew of who might have been or was a leftist, not necessarily a communist. And they already, because they had a bunch of people doing this, had a list of who you knew. And they had the FBI list. So they knew if you, you know, maybe you give them a few new names, but the purpose was to humiliate you. And it, it really, if you've read the novel 1984, really was like that. You know, I betray you, you betray me. We no longer can trust each other ever, ever, ever again. And it's not just CP, it's Anything. any leftist, progressive, even well, liberal position. Yeah, but mostly CP. That was the, the targeted body at this point. Anyway, let me, let me finish the list here because it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Adam Scott, who wrote several movies, uh, Alba, Alba Vesey, uh, who ended up, oh, by the way, Lester Cole. Isn't he the salted beer guy? Pardon me? Jesse wasn't the one who the salted beer. Bessie wasn't. Wasn't he the one who did salted beer? Bessie? No, well, he was involved in it, but not, oh, not directly. Okay. No. Um, Bud Schulberg. Finked and uh, uh, became a friendly, uh, friendly witness. Um, Dalton Trumbo held ground and refused to talk. Now, Dalton Trumbo was perhaps the wealthiest among the Hollywood Ten. He could write junk movies. He had spit them out like you go to the toilet. He was really fast and he was really good. And he really, 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 really could be depended on as a script doctor. You could go with him with a piece of crap, and you'd say, well, you know, what am I going to do with this? He'd say, oh, okay, uh, uh, tomorrow at, uh, I can think I can get it done by five, you give me $6,000 today. He could do it. But he also could produce films of real note. <coughs> Two of his big movies were, and, and were written at least simultaneously, one was Exodus. Remember Exodus? Oh, yeah. A very big Zionist mm -hmm. film. Very successful film, written by a distant relative of mine, uh, and uh, really helped to move American uh, opinion to side with Israel. So an important film. For the better or worse, important film. His other major movie was Spartacus, based on a novel by Howard Fast, um, which Kirk Douglas, who by then was the big box office name, had decided to produce. When Kirk Douglas decided to do this, he went to, uh, he went to uh, first of all, he bought Fast's novel, which he didn't have to do, because this is a historic figure, right? He could have cheated. And he went to Dalton Trumbo and said, I want you to write the script for this. And Dalton said, oh, okay. And he said, and I'm going to put your name and Howard Fast's name on the credits. You will be the writer. Howard Fast will be the book from which I drew that material. Dalton Trumbull said, really? He said, yeah. Well, that was uh, in 1960, both those movies. That broke, that really did break the blacklist in Hollywood. That decision 
by a powerful figure in the industry who could pull big money to produce a film meant that the, the whole Red Channels, Blacklist nonsense wouldn't work anymore. Now, a lot of these people had gone to Europe. Uh, you know, a lot of these people had turned to, to being uh, kind of uh, cowardly to work. Clifford Odets, who didn't come out so well, but Ilya Kazan, who made a lot of great movies, who did think and turned around. Uh, uh, Alva Bessie, one of the Hollywood uh, Ten, uh, ended up uh, as the doorman and light operator at the Hungry Eye in San Francisco. Oh, well, it's not a bad game, but <laughs> far cry from what he was doing. Uh, one of the important people in all of this is uh, uh, Paul Jericho, uh, who wrote Song of Russia and did that movie, The Search, in 1948. By the way, that was Montgomery, I think I said this, but Montgomery Cliff's big first star turn. Montgomery Clift, you know, was a very close friend of Elizabeth Taylor's, and he was gay, and it was a you know, big shadow thing in Hollywood about that. Did people pay any attention to that sort of thing? Probably not. Not in this crowd. No, no. Who cares? What? Who does what to whom really doesn't matter. Um, but it did matter in the industry because one of the things that was going on, one of the things that was going on all the time was a way to control people was to threaten to blackmail them with their personal lives. And homosexuality at that point was a big no-no. So you could easily blackmail somebody if you could get evidence of that. And the one a good chance of, uh, example of that, I think, that you might be able to relate to is Bayard Rustin. Yeah. Bayard Rustin, uh, in fact, uh, was a member of the Communist Party during the 30s and into the 40s, later became a social democrat and a member of the Socialist Party. But <clears throat> while he was a member of the party in California, he got busted doing some homosexual things in the car. So the party tossed him out because the party didn't allow homosexuality. I've never been quite clear why, but I think it had to do with their fear of blackmail. And uh, he was, because he was a known, not exactly out, because out wasn't a thing much then, because he was a known homosexual, he could not officially lead the March on Washington that Martin Luther King made the very famous speech at. But he did all the organizing work and build up for that. I worked with him in New York in uh, 1961 and two. Interesting guy. Anyway, um, I saw that PCC when they had that on for uh, Martin Luther King and all that. Right. And Okay, so I've gone very quickly through a bunch of this stuff. I wanted to also, I mentioned Salt of the Earth, but I wanted, I wanted to tell you that it could not be distributed in the United States. Why? In those days, all the uh, operators of the um, projectors in the movie theaters were unionized. And the whole American labor movement had taken, both informally and often in their own constitutions, pledges not to do anything with communists. Therefore, a film which advocated for communism could not be shown and projected by a projectionist in the projectionist union. And the, the, all of the unions in America, under the various labor laws passed, Taft-Hartley and so on, were not allowed to have communists in their leadership. So you had this way of separating out the most strong advocates for workers' rights within the labor movement from the labor movement itself. So where it once was the case that labor unions represented a social democratic reform movement, asking for a piece of the pie in a very meaningful sense, it became rather a movement that simply asked for more. And more is not a piece of the pie. It is not power sharing. If you look at the history of European democracies, which are capitalist dominated, you will see that they have strong social democratic and or labor parties and left parties to the left of that, which have an immediate impact on the governance of their societies. They therefore have better health care systems, better housing systems for their poor, uh, better job entitlements, better basic wages, and I don't want to go down the list, but hey, guess what? Your average European, even in the crisis of today, has a better deal as a working person than the average American worker. Now, I know you don't believe it. I know you won't believe it, but it's true. 
It's really, really true. You know, it's amazing. All the stats tell us that, but we don't, we don't believe it. Um, so, essentially, what you had was a climate of fear. It grew so bad that, as a thing, high school students used to take around the first ten amendments to the Constitution in, in uh, grocery stores, you know, big, big uh, Safeways and so on, try to get people to agree to them. They wouldn't. Could try to get people to sign anything. They wouldn't. Uh, if you were a kid then, if some of you were kids then, your parents would say, don't sign anything. How many of you had that experience, somebody telling you, don't sign anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that fear was almost universal. This reversal also took, a place, it took place in another kind of way. Um, you began to see a series of movies that were produced that were incredibly anti-communist. Uh, My Son John with uh, Van Heflin and Helen Hayes about a guy who comes back from Europe, totally changed, and he's now a communist, and he, and he just is all messed up, and his mother and his father are so upset, and his brother is going off to Korea, and it's just horrible. And Finally, he learns the truth of the false ideology he adopted somehow in Europe, and he goes to tell the House of American Activities Committee, but the party finds out, and they blow him away. Ever see that movie? That's a real movie. That's a real movie. Or how about how about Big Jim McClain, John Wayne's epic anti-communist film, in which John Wayne and his buddy see the snarly, nasty, intellectual, left-wing college professor refusing to testify before the House of American Activities Committee, and John Wayne's partner says, "It just turns my stomach to realize this guy could be teaching my kids." <laughs> and you, know, you realize, man, those commies are everywhere. Everywhere. Um, it's nice to know that most of these movies have not lasted. What do you mean, lasted? I mean, hardly anyone has heard of them. Well, <laughs> no. That's what I mean, lasted. There's a lot uh, of movies. I'm trying to think if there was really a good one. No, you raise a good point. They did have their impact. They did have their impact. At the time, I'm glad to hear that, you know, they didn't turn out. Anyway, um, oh, Red Planet Mars! Did I forget Red Planet Mars? <laughs> Don't want to forget Red Planet Mars. Um, or I was a com the one that really uh, was popular. I was a communist for the FBI, which actually won an Academy TV Award. It's a documentary, it which it was not. Pardon me? It became a TV series. It became a TV series and went on and 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 on. I was a communist for the FBI. Oh, it was great. And radio show too. And I led three lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Those, were, yeah. 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 those were good things. That was good things. Most of the people, over 300 major figures in Hollywood lost their jobs. Many of the executives in the industry. Most of these people, if they didn't go to jail, either left the industry and did something else in the U.S. or went to Europe. Uh, a lot of them uh, produced uh, uh, really good uh, films. Uh, Never on Sunday and uh, uh, Top Cappy uh, by... Um, Jules Dawson. Pardon me? Dawson. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of people ended up making movies in Europe. So, and in particularly in England. So a lot of Hollywood's loss was mm -hmm. Europe's gain in the movie industry. Uh, so, oh. So what, what overall effect did this have on Hollywood? It well, let me tell you. So you begin to see by the, by the uh, early middle 50s a series of films like uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, I, How to Marry a Millionaire, uh, just endless uh, uh, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, just endless bunches of light, funny, entertaining, and totally meaningless and devoid of content films. In fact, interestingly enough, uh, Jailhouse Rock, which was the second film that Elvis Presley did, was originally a story about a man coming to terms with his own nastiness and was uh, originally written by a guy named Smith, who was a, 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 a left wing. So, you know, but I bet you never knew that when you saw that movie. Remember that, you know? Surely you've seen Jailhouse Rock. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> My God, it's a great film. Um, the, the, the overall impact on the industry really is that serious message-based films began to disappear. They didn't totally disappear, 
but they began to be more and more limited. And that kinds of embedded perspectives that reflected a social democratic ideology did disappear to a great extent from film. Now it reappeared at various times. It wasn't a permanent loss, but it had an enormous in, in, in impact in the industry. And if it hadn't been for certain people being very brave, it would have been much more impacting. Um, I want to I want to jump now to something else, which is really perhaps more important, which is that all of the, this all the time that this was happening within African American communities in the United States, the NAACP and later other organizations like CORE and eventually like SNCC and the Southern uh, Christian Leadership uh, Council began to develop programs to demand equal rights for African Americans. The, uh, the NAACP forced all the way to the Supreme Court the question of the notion of Plessy v. Ferguson, that is separate but equal, in schooling and public accommodation. The courts ruled in 1954, and then with all due speed in 1956, <coughs> that school integration had to take place in the United States. And this was an incredibly important decision. About the same period of time, the Montgomery bus boycott happened, and carefully chosen to help lead that was, of uh, course, Martin Luther King, who had a church in Montgomery. Now, King had been part of the group of people who learned organizing techniques. Now, remember, he's a minister to begin with, but who learned organizing techniques. <coughs> uh, and this really is an extremely important thing. Uh, who learned them at the Highlander Folk School. How many of you heard of Highlander Folk School? Very important institution in Tennessee. Highlander trained the C a lot of CIO organizers. Highlander trained a lot of the people who struggled in the integration fight. Highlander worked tirelessly to preserve American folk music. All of that in a small location. They still exist. If you feel like giving a nonprofit some money, that you can be really clean-headed about, Highlander Folk School still exists, really worthwhile. The other person who was trained there was Rosa Parks, of course. Pardon me? Rosa Parks also trained Oh, there. yeah, yeah, I, I didn't mean to leave anybody out. Yeah, yeah, Rosa yeah, well, Parks was trained. A lot of people were trained there. To get some sense of how this all worked, though, on another level, consider uh, Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. who I'm sure some of you could. Paul Robeson was an interesting guy, uh, African-American, uh, All-American in football and several other sports at Rutgers, <coughs> which is the State University of New Jersey. Uh, an opera singer, yes for sure, an uh, actor on the live stage, and in terrible, terrible movies for the most part. Mm -hmm. Phi Beta uh, Kappa and a lawyer. Pardon me? Phi Beta Kappa and a lawyer. Yeah, Phi Beta Kappa and a lawyer, yes, yes, yes. He was a very bright guy. <laughs> and he was a very, very good singer. And he chose to sing <coughs> a lot of the old Spanish uh, Civil War songs. And he was an important figure in the left communities, and he was incredibly punished. A large part of the laws passed, uh, Taft-Hartley and so on, essentially were designed to keep people from, like him from traveling in the world. Hold them in the United States, kind of hostage if not prisoner. And when he did it, when he did a, a famous concert, I think it was 1947 or 48, I can't remember the exact year, in, uh, in a summer camp, I believe it was in upstate New York, the, un the uh, American Legion and a bunch of left of right wing groups lined the road coming out of there and threw, uh, the police, of course, did nothing, threw bottles and bricks and other heavy objects at all the cars leaving that uh, concert. Uh, Robeson was uh, essentially stripped of every uh, possible avenue to reform. I saw him. In 1958, at the uh, at uh, Richmond's First Unitarian Church on Wilshire Boulevard in L.A., uh, the First Unitarian Church in L.A. was one of the refuges for uh, liberal and left people after the uh, after the busting up of all of the left-wing organizations in the L.A. region. I believe the minister of that church was somebody that stood up directly to the. the yeah, no, yeah, that's true. You wrote a book about it. Yeah, no, Fritchman was a good guy. Um, what was his name? Fritchman. 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 Anyway, um, 
I want to now move to two other things. First, I want to talk about the new left a little bit. And then I'm going to open it, I will, talk about the new left a little bit and talk about uh, uh, the, the FBI and COINTELPRO, or COUNTELPRO. Uh, the new left organization that we all know and is most famous in our minds among white folks is SDS, Students for Democratic Society. Now, its origin rests in, the, in LID, the League for Industrial Democracy, which was an organization within the socialist, remember that's anti-Stalinist, uh, the socialist part, right? The Norman Thomas Socialists. You recall from last time there was the socialists with Norman Thomas and the leadership that didn't get very far, the communists who managed to blend in and operate within uh, the organized labor and other things and were much more successful in many ways. But the Socialist Party continued and <coughs> it did have its own organizational things and it has its youth organization called YPSL, Young People's Socialist League. How many were in YPSL? <laughs> Give a shout out if you were in YPSL. How about the Du Bois Club? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> How about the uh, YCL, Young Communist League? Oh, these are things with which we can all identify, yes, well. Anyway, all these young people's organizations were part of these uh, larger left-wing organizations. And the League for Industrial Democracy lost control of its Students for Democratic Society when it moved away from being a labor-centered student organization to being a college and high school-centered student organization. And that's where Tom Hayden and others get involved. And that's where the Port Huron Statement comes out, which any of you, if you're interested at all in any of this stuff, should take the trouble to read. It's online. It's really a bit of very brilliant writing. And it's really an important document. And SDS became a significant force in this period. But there was something else going on which was young people, just in general, were getting tired of being treated like children. And that meant that by 1964, young people who were increasingly concerned over the objective conditions in the world, specifically the likelihood of a thermonuclear war, the failure of the United States to support democracy, the, the total totalitarianism of a variety of efforts to control governments like Iran. By the way, the whole problem of Iran centers on the decisions of the CIA and others to smash the legitimately elected government in Iran um, of Mozambique and to install the Shah. Installing the Shah meant repressing the Iranian people. It meant giving real and legitimate grievance to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Shia Muslims. It, rem it meant that once the revolution came to Iran, Democracy didn't stand a chance, and you ended up with a Shia regime, and you ended up with a crazy guy in charge, as is the case, and you end up with a situation which I'm going to predict to you right now will lead us into some kind of horrible disaster within the next 10 years. So well, Mohammed yeah. Mosaday, I guess he was the beginning of it, huh? Pardon me? Mohammed Mosaday was the beginning of it, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Overthrowing him, uh, and I'm not going to spend time telling you how it was done, but it was very clever. Uh, Overthrowing Mossadegh and his legitimate government was the beginning of what we are now. Hey, no bad deed by the CIA goes unpunished on the world. Just remember that. And, and the CIA under Eisenhower was, you know, Eisenhower didn't like war. He really thought wars were horrible. He experienced war. He wanted to avoid it. So for him, the CIA was a wonderful option. It could do, uh, it could do covert action all over the world and never be held accountable. And that became our policy for a long, long time. Until we slipped, I mean, the two times we got into wars, uh, Korea unavoidable, what we did in Korea, which <coughs> was, uh, if we had stopped at the 38th parallel, we would have been winners and it would have been great. Unfortunately, bad China lobby thinking and, uh, and uh, General MacArthur led us into a situation where the Chinese could enter the war and then it led to a stalemate and now we're back to where it was after many, many deaths and, and a crazy North Korea and a weirdly capitalist South Korea and no end to that war, actually. So there's that one. The other, uh, I mean, there's, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Many, many major horrors 
brought about through the foreign policy of covert action. Uh, many, many people dying, many, many uh, freedom movements shattered, many, many turns of events that led the United States into being the bad guy in the minds of many people, particularly in developing nations in the world. Peculiar foolishness. All right, we have SDS. We also have, uh, within the black movements, the rise of these indigenous black organizations, the rise of American Indian movement, and a whole host of others coming into the 1960s, uh, the late 60s, 70s, all of which have, as driving force, into uh, an effort toward, legitimate effort toward equality. Meanwhile, the looming fact of the inability of a popular movement with a majority of Americans by 1968 to put an end to an unwinnable, clearly unwinnable war in Southeast Asia. So that, that, that just brings you up to where I want to stop today. But you must understand that the new left owes very little, except in the sense that some of the kids in it were influenced by their parents who were reds of one sort or another. But the whole movement was indigenous, American, and really free, totally free from the influence of China or the Soviet Union. Uh, I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask you if you have any questions. Um, I'll just add, I think you didn't mention the women's movement. Oh my God! I didn't mention the women's movement. You're saying the gay movement. Oh, yeah. Or gay liberation. There are a lot of things. Okay. It was a women's movement. That was. <laughs> Pardon me? The disabled, too. They all oh, the disabled. Don't forget. What was that paper that you said was mm -hmm. something uh, important to read? The Pure Huron paper? Uh, Pura, Port Huron. How do you Port Huron <laughs> statement. R Actually, just go uh, Google Port Huron statement. H U R O N. Yeah. Like the. Uh, it's P U R. Like the lake. Huron. H U R O N. Ah, okay. And like uh, the lake. It, it'll be right there. And Thank it's, you. you know, it's not that long. It's really worth reading. Uh, yes, that's a good criticism. I did totally ignore the women's movement. I would say that the most significant reality of the women's movement is the reality of women's condition in the United States. Remember that in 1920, women finally got the right to vote. And that was delayed for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was the fear of the liquor lobby that the women's Christian temperance movement, which was associated in many minds, but not necessarily so much in reality, with the women's suffrage it movement, was true. would yeah it would lead promise. directly to the yeah no no that was the yeah. liquor lobby was big force against women's uh, well the men that drank too pardon me the men that drank too well the men that drank <laughs> hell yeah they were right no it was a <laughs> look. Alcohol. And, alcohol. A, lot of men, and a lot of men, Sandy, who still can't handle it. Right? No, no, I'm no, I'm no, I didn't well, think right, right in that right. the next thing that happened with the prohibition. <laughs> the objective reality of prohibition was that it was largely influenced by women who experienced the abusive, uh, the abusive behavior of men who had, had used alcohol as a way of relieving the enormous pressures and tensions of their working situations, while women actually were doing a lot of work in the real workforce, but were officially supposed to be homemakers. I, I don't want it, it's too complicated. It gets very... And brought the abuse home and spent the money. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I'll set you all we up with a, a drink here. Over there. The kitties can wait. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, you have a question over here, Joe. I wanted to do questions, and there was somebody who had a question. Yeah, right yeah. There. yeah, I'm actually raising my head before talking. <laughs> Which Supreme Court case was it that decided the First Amendment defense was was not going to be accepted on the part of people accused of being communists? Uh, or it was Dennis v. Uh, uh, Dennis v. I can't remember the the Justice Department guy, but that was that was it. Dennis was uh, head of the Eugene. Communist Party then. Yeah. Um, I have it here, yeah. I have it here, the actual citation, which I'll give that's you. A, I've never heard of that, and that sounds really critical in that whole phase of the history. Well, no, it is very critical. I thought you were going to say that people would plead the Fifth Amendment, but actually they... No, they made a tactical and very brave decision to stand on the First Amendment. It was foolish, because the Fifth Amendment would have worked. They had the right to not incriminate themselves. Yeah. And but then the burden of proof would have been on the state, which was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Didn't the but did the Hollywood 
Didn't they do the fifth? No, they did the they First did the Amendment. First as well. It was because a political decision by the Communist Party to fight for First Amendment rights. Yeah. yeah. And so it was a mistake. That's basically. what always amazed me about, about that history was that, I mean, after all, what, don't we have a First Amendment? You know, I mean, are we supposed to be able to believe and, and say whatever we want in this country? You know, no, no. So the answer is no. <laughs> so the Supreme Court said no to that. Yeah. Because, because the argument was the communists are engaged in a, in, a, in a direct act of subversion against and an attempt to throw overthrow the United States government by force of violence. That's the rationale. This isn't the one with the uh, yelling fire in a crowded theater. No, no, that's much earlier. Okay. And not about that. So it was a matter <coughs> of national security. Yes. There, yeah, there yeah. We have an overwhelming impression. A bit late now. Uh, this, was, this was how you could have, under law, until the courts finally did, throw it out, the possibility of all of us in this room being rounded up and taken to uh, Tule Lake. Well, but aren't we seeing that happen today? Yes. Uh, with and protesting and whistleblowers and things? A, a, a lot of deja vu, but I've, you didn't really talk about Cointel and FBI. And I haven't come to it yet. Oh, sure. oh okay. Good. Well, well, also, let me just, I was know. hoping someone, well, maybe that's a good question that's not trick to it. What the FBI decided to do under J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover is, by the way, an enemy of the United States, yeah. truly. Yeah. Did more harm to our constitutional uh, rights than anybody I could think of. Uh, really, really, really scary guy. Um, and COINTELPRO was a program initiated by the FBI um, beginning in uh, 1958 and lasting officially till, officially till 1971. And what it was, according to the FBI, uh, was, I mean, it's really actually amazing because it's, it's right there. Uh, what it was to um, use psychological warfare, uh, forging documents, false reporting uh, in the media, smearing people with sexual accusations, um, using, uh, <coughs> creating documents that would create for example, Karunga, remember him with the Black Nationalist Organization out of LA? Yeah. He he was accused of producing documents that talked about attacking the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party was supposed to have produced documents attacking him. All of it was made up by the FBI. Mm -hmm. Anytime the FBI found out about somebody being unfaithful to their partner or being gay or something, they would leak that information to sources that could do them harm. Uh, it, it extended to the point where a guy named Fred Hampton, who was the leader of the Black Panther Party in the Chicago region, was murdered in his bed by the local police under the guidance of the FBI. And I, I'm not going to talk about you know, personal experience and stuff like this, but there's plenty of activity in Portland, Oregon, by the famous Red Squad, which I'm afraid is back. You know, I was very disappointed when this city decided finally to join the... Uh, the anti-terrorism task, task force. I think it's just a foolish decision. I think that it's, uh, first of all, I know the FBI is all good now, <laughs> but <laughs> hey, you don't ever, ever, ever want to have a good security service in a society. Best to have people struggle and to use democracy as your weapon. And I think that's really an important principle. And it's just, it, it's so distressing to me to see this uh, going on at this point. But about Fred Hampton, his son last year spoke at, at uh, Harrison. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I'm glad he got to have a son. Good guy. They sure blew him away good. Um, but the important thing about COINTELPRO is that it operated in every city and every area of the United States. And we still don't have a whole picture of all of the things it did. Even now, occasionally there'll be a story in the New York Times about some thing that they did. They're still persecuting uh, people who were Black Panthers way back when. You know, this stuff goes on and on and on. And uh, it, it is, to me, quite clear that this program accounts for a lot of disturbing activities. I told you last time, I think, about the flag lowering thing that I did with the Ajahn provocateur trying to get us to violate law so that there would be a conspiracy. Uh, stuff like that was just stands. Every city in the United States had, and maybe still has, a security division, uh, 
the subversive control division, the red, the red squad. Today or was it yesterday? Pardon me? In New York, they framed another yeah. kid the way they did the Oh, yeah, well, they got this kid in New York. Dumb kid. Yeah. But, yeah, and then there was this dumb kid here with the Christmas bomb. Right. Remember him? Right. So <clears throat> what, what often happens is that people with bad ideas are encouraged in their bad ideas, and then when they are you know, given the opportunity to actually carry out their bad ideas, they're so stupid uh, that they do it. And then that gives the government further fodder to make us further afraid. Now, would these people have eventually done something bad? And there's no way to know. No way to know. But it's certainly clear that without the help of the government, they couldn't have done whatever it was that they thought they were doing. So, you know, that's really, to me, really dubious. Other questions or comments? Aside from leaving out the entire half of the... Just when did people... Portland join with the FBI again? I thought they refused to do that. To, did for a while. Partnership. Have they now made partnership with... Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. right. changed. Yeah, I think... I, I don't know, but I think just about every city is. The deal... But the assumption is that it's a new and good FBI, right? Jeb Hoover's dead. Uh, no, more, no more drag queen head of FBI. Uh, you know, that's cool. Um, everything's nice, everything's good, CIA is good, doesn't do bad things anymore, drones are cool, <laughs> drones are cool, uh, it's all cool. And terrorism is very vaguely defined. Again. Terrorism yeah. could be, yeah, it's very vaguely defined. And this president, who I'm going to support because of the issue of women's rights and maybe protecting Social Security and Medicare, because the other guy is really weird and walks funny. Um, Supreme Court. Supreme Court, Supreme Court, Supreme Court. Can I say something unrelated to your talk, but related to what you just said? Yeah. He did not request the binders of women. The women's organizations were so appalled at women not getting leadership, they created the binder and presented it to him. Well, actually, it was resumes. They yeah. weren't even in a binder. But the point is, he was lying that he yeah. asked. Oh, he always lies. The guy is a pathological liar. Who soon may be president of the United States. Don't let me get started on that with the muscle boy with him. Yeah. I'm always suspicious of muscle voice, but that's because I'm not. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, you were talking about before how, how kids were sent out and told, don't sign anything, don't sign anything. Right. Was that so as not to be entrapped? Well, yeah. The assumption was it'll come back to haunt you. You sign a seemingly harmless document saying that you want to see uh, integration in the South. And somehow that gets used against you in employment or something later. So like a petition? You're a communist. Yeah, yeah. It'll it say never it really, was, I don't think it was really a true petition. thing. But it created, was. my point was that the climate of fear descended on the whole world, and particularly on the United States. People really, really, really were afraid. And that dark fear was broken, actually, by, uh, by the, the black struggle in the South, by the women's movement, and by the student movement. Not by labor, which just kind of folded in all of this, and I think we see the cost of labor's folding right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're saying a bunch of things, and I'm getting a lot from it. Uh, there was a special on um, um, the, uh, in the Twilight Zone, um, the guy that wrote the Twilight Zone. Ross Sterling. Ross Sterling. Yeah, real, really good special, and then there were parts of it were kind of special. He had uh, written for Firehouse, Playhouse 90 at this point. Yeah, yeah, Rod Sterling wrote for Playhouse 90. He also wrote for the Philco Theater. Yeah, but in, in that example, uh, he wrote something that had to do with a, a real situation, like uh, getting out of jail or something like that, and ethics and stuff like that. And his producers, the, the people that, uh, advertisers and stuff, they, they changed it around. It was a cowboy movie and, and nothing that he had anything to do with. Right. Now this ties in with what you're talking about, about Hollywood and after that effect that you said uh, had, that was brought on Hollywood was they never put any, any films out with substance. Well, yes, but let me explain that in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in another kind of way. The once uh, commercial television, once television was given over completely to private enterprise, yeah. 
uh, once, once the theory of uh, single sponsorships or multiple sponsorships of shows developed, the advertising agencies became major players in decision making about script. And that is still the case. So it's very difficult, very, very difficult to get material that is either refreshingly new in, in general uh, or to get material that challenges conventional notions uh, on, the, on the mainstream media. And that's still, I mean, that's still the case. What has happened that has uh, changed that is uh, the uh, availability of the cable channels. And the cable channels operate more like the new movie industry in that they, have, they can reach five million people, let's say, whose views would be very different than a so-called mass audience watching CBS, ABC, or NBC. But if you also are paying attention to the general mass media, which is what most people know about, you will notice that, for example, CBS is ill-reporting the debates. I mean, really not accurately reporting them. There's no fact-checking going on. The whole thing is out of control, particularly by CBS, somewhat the same by NBC and by ABC. Uh, and Fox News, of course, which is very well watched, I think something like 30% of the general audience watches Fox News, totally lies. I mean, just, you know, whatever the lie of the day is. And they always, every single person on their shows says exactly the same four or five words. And that's considered perfectly legit. Now, it's free, you know, this is freedom. Anyway, I, any other questions about this stuff? Have I covered stuff that you didn't know? Have I helped you understand stuff you did know? Uh, can I go home? <laughs> what do you want to have? Yeah. Yeah, just what I wanted to carry on with that, with those two couple things that I put forth to you, was that uh, this is, shows the, the, the lack of supportiveness of democracy in the world from 1951. Well, look, um, the repression of democratic yeah, movements out is a, a cross-cultural universal. Anyway, uh, other questions? Other interests? Yeah? You didn't mention the voters here. I'm sorry? You didn't mention the voters here. That's true. And, uh, I was involved in that, and so I noticed. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, there's so many things I haven't really adequately covered. I think that, that I've just barely cut the surface of a lot of stuff. And I think that there should be, for credit maybe even at the university, more material uh, on this whole <coughs> topic. I don't feel that I have even begun, as I said, to have done an adequate job. There's, there's endless material. We haven't, for example, talked in, the, in terms of the uh, overseas activity, uh, the way in which the United States operated in Turkey, the way in which the United States operated in Greece, uh, the way in which Fr the United States made uh, peace with the Mafia in uh, France to defeat the Communist Party in Marseille. Hey, there's a piece of action you probably don't know about, uh, but it's true. I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of stuff. And the American people largely are functioning in a state of mythic suspension, where they, their ideas about the world are close to what high school teachers like you to think America is about. I think that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, and we have a flyer on our next um, program which is going to be on a Wednesday, November 14th, and that'll be in Smith Center, which is one building over, and I'm not oriented enough to know, I think it's that direction, but I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, it's one building south. Uh, and it's going to be on the Grange, uh, which might surprise some of you, but the Grange is really progressive, and I think you'll find it very, very interesting. And, uh, and it is not the casino. <laughs>